thank you everybody for logging on tonight uh, w uh, to MHPN's interdisciplinary panel discussion uh, on collaborative care and hoarding. We've had 998 people register. So far, we've got 277 people online. I'm sure we will get more as we go through the night. Uh, our panel tonight is a particularly uh, talented panel. My name is Michael Murray. I'm a GP in Townsville. Uh, I have an interest in mental health, uh, but practice as a GP mostly. Um, the first person I'd like to introduce you to is Professor Jane Dunn. She is an academic and a GP from Victoria. Jane, can I just ask you, how, how did you first get an interest in, in mental health and general practice? Uh, well, Michael, it was really because uh, the people that came to see me often had underlying mental health concerns as to why they were there on that particular day with that particular problem and I just came to realise how much of general practice is actually tied up with both psychological and sort of psychosocial concerns and that um, drove my interest. Great. Good. Thank you very much. The next person I'd like to introduce is um, Steve McFarlane. Um, Steve is a psychiatrist uh, from, the peninsula, from the peninsula area in um, Melbourne, Victoria. Um, he has a special interest in um, Alzheimer's disease and senile squalor. How did you first get interested in, in, um, in, uh, in aging medicine and psychiatry? Well, I guess uh, psychiatry was the first interest, and that uh, stemmed from you know the, the decade of the brain in the 1990s and the feeling that there'd be a great range of advances in psychiatry in my practicing lifetime. I guess uh, aged psychiatry was almost an afterthought for me. I was fortunate enough to have a very... Uh, enthusiastic, uh, young and inspiring mentor, and I suppose in many areas of medicine, uh, a, a powerful mentor attracts us into the field. So that's how I ended up doing age psychiatry, which was really the last thing I saw myself doing right. prior to that. That's, that's very, very interesting. Mentorship is very important, isn't it? Mm. Next person I'd like to introduce to you is uh, Mike Curious. Um, uh, Mike is a psychologist, um, um, mainly based at Swinburne in Victoria. Uh, and Mark, you have a, a specific interest in, in hoarding and cluttering. How did you first get involved in that? Well, I'm a clinical psychologist in terms of my training, Michael, and um, I became very interested in obsessive compulsive disorder around about the, toward the end of the 90s when OCD was really not considered to be a treatable disorder. Um, and having um, worked with a number of researchers around the world developing treatments and, and approaches to understanding OCD, I then became interested in what was then considered to be a subtype of OCD, um, but obviously now is considered to be a, a separate disorder in and of itself. Thank you very much. That's very, very interesting. And the last person I'm going to introduce is uh, Julie Harris. Um, Julie is a community ageing strategist uh, with the um, Metropolitan Fire and Emergency Services Board in Victoria. She liaises extensively with the community. And um, I'm fascinated to know, Julie, how you first became involved in this area. Before I joined the Metropolitan Fire Brigade, my role was in community services, um, in case management across age and disability and management of Commonwealth and state programs. Sorry, and Judy, may I just ask you to speak up a little bit? We, oh, we're sorry. just finding it difficult to hear you. My, my background is in uh, case management in aged and disability services. And so I had seen a lot of hoarding and well, uh, within that context. And then when I came to the Metropolitan Fire Brigade, there were a series of uh, fatalities in house fires involving people of a range of ages um, in hoarding fires. And that became an imperative for this brigade and increasingly brigades in other states to address um, hoarding and fire risk, which is extreme. Oh, thank you. That's very, very interesting. And um, yes... That would have been a great stimulus to get involved. Thank you very much for that. I'm just going to just um, um, look at the learning objectives for tonight. Um, at the end of, this se of the session, participants will be better equipped to recognize the key principles of intervention and the roles of different disciplines in treating, managing, and supporting people who hoard. And this will be reflected in the first part of the, um, of the evening where the participants um, uh, talk to their to their PowerPoint. And then secondly, to better understand the merits, challenges and opportunities in providing collaborative care to people who hoard. 
and that will be reflected in the excellent questions that we've already received from uh, participants and in questions and answers that the panel will give to each other. So, without further ado, uh, we will move on to the GP perspective. Okay, thanks Michael. Um, well, we're talking about the case of uh, Isabella tonight and um, the thing that strikes me is that uh, if uh, Brian came into my clinic talking about his wife Isabella and the issue around her magazines and uh, problems would be that it's not an everyday presentation. Um, but my um, ears would go up and I would be very interested in taking the concerns that he's expressing to me very, very seriously. And the thing that I think is obvious as a GP is that there's really um, two, if not more, patients here. There's Brian, the husband, who's, who's telling me about his concerns, and there's his wife, Isabella, that um, I'm going to be um, thinking more about as, as we go on. Um, I would be very, very keen to find out as much as I could from Brian about the problem and about how he's feeling about it but also to make the most of the opportunity to do the home visit. Um, I also note that uh, the practice that I belong to has uh, regular practice meetings where we discuss cases in detail and I think it's a great idea, not that um, it's something that happens really regularly in practices. So that's how I'd sort of start thinking about the problem um, and then I'd really be aiming to build a trusting relationship with both Brian and Isabella so that I can do a, a thorough assessment and think about an appropriate management plan. Um, I think, you know, from the GP perspective, I'd be really wanting to find out whether this concern of Brian's, you know, why, why had it come on today? Why was he coming to me and telling me about this issue now? Was this something that, even though he says he's been sick of it over many years, is there something that has sort of suddenly changed to, to bring this about, other than just the, the tummy bug that he speaks of um, in the, the, the case we've been given? Um, I'd be interested to know whether it's been a slow decline or increase in, in her problem, or whether it sort of comes and goes, and perhaps there's some trigger and reason for why um, Isabella is as she is at the moment. Um, the sorts of clinical problems I'd be thinking about um, would be both from the point of view of the husband as well as Isabella, um, in particular whether he's having troubles with de depression or other issues that may have prompted him to, to bring, as, as you like, Isabella as his um, ticket of entry to the consultation. So I'd be thinking of that. But then also with Isabella's problem, is she presenting with, is it that she has underlying depression or anxiety or OCD? Um, is there some hidden alcohol or substance use disorder? And what about her sort of personality factors? I'd be really interested to know um, whether if I hadn't seen her before, if other members of the practice had and if I could glean any information from um, understanding her situation in the past. Um, also, I think something that's easy to forget when we're confronted with these unusual, um, what seem to be unusual presentations is her physical health and I'd be very keen to get her to come for a full sort of physical health checkup to make sure that there was no underlying physical health problem that might have caused her mental health issue, if you like, to deteriorate. Um, I'd be, you know, during that home visit, I'd be really wanting to examine Isabella to see, did she have any sort of, um, was she giving any signs of um, psychotic thought or delusions or anything like that? And was her insight particularly good? Did she have insight into a problem? Um, was there any evidence of cognitive impairment? Um, I think as GPs, if we've known these people beforehand, it's often easier for us to identify change if we haven't seen them for a while. But if we've seen them regularly, sometimes we're like family members and sort of become used to that slow decline. So I'd be looking to, to see whether I could see any particular difference in if I had met her before. Um, I'd also be assessing the relationship between Brian and Isabella. I mean, I, I think that there's issues around um, relationships that may not be evident until things emerge. And I, I'd wonder about whether there was any violence in the relationship, whether things were um, as, as good as they were presented by Brian in the consulting room to me. And just keep an open mind about that. 
Um, also then assessing their living environment for um, is it so that he can't get around the house? Is this a level of risk that uh, both hygiene or safety be due to her level of keeping of these magazines? And I'd be hoping that I would get some kind of idea as a sort of differential diagnosis and um, working out whether or not Isabella was going to um, be be taking a voluntary part in this management plan and wanting help or whether actually this was going to be a very, very challenging situation. Um, I think for many of us as GPs, these sorts of cases are very, very time consuming and um, we have to spend a lot of time thinking about what to do, assessing them, working out how urgent the problem is and then deciding who we might go and call upon um, in terms of referral. And I think that um, actually organising referral for a case like this, um, certainly in my experience, is something that is very time consuming and is certainly not something that you um, do at the click of a button like we may for some other, other problems that are more common. So I think one of the challenges with this case is for having good networks to ensure that the referral will be accepted, will be to the right person and I'm really interested to hear from other panellists um, as to how we might go about making that referral process um, much more streamlined and less time consuming from the GP perspective. So back to you Michael. Thank you very much Jane, that was a, that was a very good presentation and has really set the scene for the, for the case uh, this evening where remember that we're talking about Isabella, Brian and the elements of hoarding that are involved. But now we're going to move on um, to uh, Stephen McFarland to get a specialist um, psychiatrist view on it. Uh, thank you, Michael, uh, for the opportunity to speak. I'm struggling to advance the slide here. Here we go. Uh, the case of uh, Isabella, as presented, you know, does seem to be a reasonably easy diagnostic one in terms of compulsive hoarding. I mean, we've got a very long history for a start. This lady's been collecting magazines and uh, missing patterns, etc., for 40 odd years, and it's an ego dystonic thing. She's aware that she does it. It's brought her into conflict with her husband and it's reached the stage where her living circumstances, uh, her living spaces at home are, are unusable. One key point I'd like to get across to the audience tonight is that uh, hoarding is not necessarily the only pathway that leads people into living in cluttered circumstances. Uh, I'm a bit concerned that the terms hoarding and squalor tend to be used interchangeably. Uh, where in fact there's many uh, pathways into, into squalor and filth. Uh, hoarding disorder as such is this long-standing process that begins in the teens and early 20s and is, is really a lifelong process characterised by an active acquisition of objects, the uh, failure to dispose of which is consequent upon distress when, when that's attempted. Uh, there's a probably larger group of people who decline into squalor, typically in old age, where hoarding is not necessarily a symptom. It can be, but it tends not to be a lifelong uh, feature in these cases. Uh, passive squalor, if you like, or passive degeneration to squalor is more a result of uh, a failure to adequately maintain the environment rather than a compulsion to hoard. So people will discard rubbish, but they'll discard it in the living space and not really care that that results in, in mess, uh, filth and, and decomposition. So try and differentiate hoarding from, uh, from squalor if at all possible. The, the issue of comorbidities in hoarding disorder is, is a key one. Uh, research in uh, senile squalor only goes back several decades, but you know, the early case series that were published uh, showed that up to 50% of people who lived in uh, circumstances that were objectively unreasonable had a psychotic uh, diagnosis. Uh, a large proportion of them in these early case series uh, found that there was no underlying cognitive disability and that many, in fact, were of high average intelligence. Uh, this figure in relation to the first description of Diogenes syndrome in 1975 stated confidently that 50% uh, of patients living in squalor had a psychiatric diagnosis. The implication is that 50% uh, of people who live like this don't, and I just find that very hard to believe 
with the uh, wide range of comorbidities that can accompany the uh, the objective living circumstance of squalor, of which the uh, the OCD variant, or so-called hoarding disorder, as it's going to be called in DSM-5, is only one. There's a, a wide variety of conditions that can result in the end, same end-stage phenotype of the environment, and uh, trying to differentiate these other things from hoarding disorder is, is a key uh, task of the assessment process, in my opinion. My view uh, overall on circumstances which result in squalor is that uh, there's a likely common thread in the being frontal lobe impairment in most of these patients. Clearly not everybody who has a frontal lobe impairment lives in squalor, but uh, I feel it's likely to be a, a prerequisite that one exists. Uh, similarly, not everybody who has uh, an obsessive compulsive type of presentation has a frontal impairment, and not all of those live in squalor, but a proportion will. And the same is true for those other diagnoses that are presented uh, up on the screen there. So for me, the, the key to uh, informing management of the situation, uh, and, and it's usually the situation which brings things to a, to a head, the clutter of the environment rather than the disorder, which has often been there for many years, but the key to management of that uh, physical situation is a proper assessment that uh, delineates the comorbidities and which can then uh, inform management. I, I know a key subject of tonight's uh, discussion is the uh, collaborative, multidisciplinary uh, nature of managing hoarding and squalor. And to that end, I'd just like to give a brief plug to a uh, document there, the, uh, the web reference which is listed that's been produced by a working party convened by the Victorian government uh, looking at multidisciplinary and collaborative agency responses to squalor and, and hoarding disorder. It's a very good web reference and the formal document will be uh, launched shortly, I believe. Uh, back to you, Michael. Thank you very much for that, Steve. That was, that was a very good presentation. We'll now move on to Mike Kyrgios, our psychologist, for his perspective. Thanks, Michael. Look, um, as, as Steve has already indicated, there's been a fair bit of research, um, including some that's been conducted in our centre, that, that really does show that there is significant uh, behavioural, neurobiological and other differences between hoarding and, and obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, and, and so this has kind of led to this uh, position now where hoarding disorder will be a separate diagnosis in DSM-5. It's a very heterogeneous disorder um, and I'd really like to support Steve's comments about the distinctions between hoarding disorder and other disorders and the differential roads that clutter in the house. Um, I, I won't go through the, um, I guess, the uh, symptoms of, of, of hoarding disorder. You know, uh, Steve's already outlined what they are. Um, but I do want to emphasise some of the psychological factors that um, do differentiate, I guess, uh, hoarding disorder from, from some of the other um, disorders. Um, with respect to squalor, what we see is that um, comorbidity is more commonly associated with dementia, alcohol-related brain syndromes, and schizophrenia, delusional disorders. Whereas hoarding disorder is more commonly associated with depression, uh, generalised anxiety disorder, um, um, social anxiety, and of course trauma-related disorders. Um, in terms of etiology, there are a range of information processing and, I guess, um, decision-making deficits that we see, with including attentional problems, um, you know, the memory difficulties. Um, uh, some, you know, some studies uh, find them, others don't. Uh, but certainly at the very least, there's poor confidence in memory and certain selective memory. Um, cognitive decline is also common, and I guess in Isabella's case, I'd like to know what was going on there. You know, is she having difficulties, for instance, using the iPad, or is she just reluctant to use it because she feels, you know, she's being controlled by Brian? Um, trauma and other developmental and emotional issues are very common in the hoarding disorder. Um, people with hoarding problems are much more likely to report traumatic events they're much more likely to report lesser warmth in their families of origin. They're much more likely to um, report chaotic family backgrounds and family histories of hoarding. Um, and, and I guess from my point of view, looking at Isabella's case, I'd like to know a little bit more about these past fertility issues and the effect that they've had on her, because I think that they may be of particular interest. Um, issues of attachment are also very common. People with hoarding problems have insecure attachments. They find the world and other people to be particularly challenging and they see objects as extensions of themselves. 
Um, there are obviously some negative identity and poor self-esteem issues. Often these relate back to some of the developmental um, influences. Um, and of course there are erroneous beliefs about the nature of possession. So the notion that, that people are personally responsible for possessions, uh, have a greater need to maintain control over the possessions, all of these are, uh, tend to be fairly common amongst um, people reporting problems. And I'd like to know what meaning the possessions have for Isabella, for instance. Um, does she see these um, as being, for instance, a, um, a, a compensation for some of the uh, emotion issues that she's been um, um, ex that she has experienced? In terms of what to do about it, obviously, um, accurate diagnosis and case formulation is absolutely imperative. Uh, enforced cleanouts are not effective, and actually, may make the situation worse. Um, some of the data that we've seen from the states shows that um, things improve in only about 15% of the, uh, 15 of cases when there are enforced cleanouts. Um, only about 30% of people are cooperative in the cleanup, um, but actually end up doing very little about it, and about 40% refuse. Um, and so enforcement and engagement become a real issue. Um, there is a specific form of cognitive behaviour therapy that's been shown to have uh, moderate to large effect sizes. Um, and, you know, is becoming very popular and can be disseminated in a whole range of forms, including peer-supported forms, group uh, formats, individual therapy formats, and even online formats. Um, the, the major obstacle, I think, and, and is, is really the, the effect of poor insight, and we do see a lot of um, insight problems in, in the hoarding disorder, and also um, asking ourselves how we might leverage opportunities to, to engage people positively. Um, opportunities do arise that are fairly negative, such as addiction, um, but one can often um, leverage such opportunities to, to help people engage more positively in uh, cognitive behaviour therapy. Um, in terms of what to do, just to change this, right, um, we kind of need to, to tackle helplessness and hopelessness. It's usually been a problem over many years and people basically have given up. Um, often they don't even see the clutter around them. Um, we need to help people maintain high degrees of motivation. And we do this by focusing on how they'd like to use specific spaces and to work out what they need to do to achieve this. We actually don't focus on discarding um, uh, positions and, and, and sorting out the clutter, although these are obviously very important, um, uh, um, I guess, stages in, in the treatment. Um, and, and overall, our focus is on improving well-being and, and minimising harm. Um, we provide accurate information so that affected individuals and their families can understand the condition, understand the recovery process, and actually also navigate their way around a very complex system. Steve referred to the um, um, uh, uh, document that was, has been put together by the Victorian government, and it's a very complex system that people are having to deal with. Um, we help people control their distress. We give them greater control over their acquisition urges. We help them to deal with the um, clutter um, by improving their organisational and sorting skills, their decision making, and of course we undertake a fair bit of exposure based work, um, exposure to discarding and exposure to non acquisition. Um, and in so doing, we help them develop more useful beliefs about um, their positions, we help them to deal with their um, social isolation, and of course we help them to develop a more positive sense of uh, identity and to develop more healthy lifestyles. So that's kind of the, 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 the the treatment in a nutshell, um, we um, have a group at Swinburne, uh, it takes about 12 weeks to get, get through the group, but in fact the treatment of this disorder really um, needs at least a 20 to 26 week kind of window um, just to get things started and unfortunately current um, uh, programs or current um, funding uh, models don't really um, help people through the whole, um, you know, uh, the whole process of change, and that's why a multidisciplinary approach is absolutely imperative. So that's, that's it from me, Michael. Thanks for, for that opportunity. Thank you very much, Mark. It was really good. Thanks very much. Now, we'll just hear from, uh, from Julie, our community ageing strategist. Um, thanks, Michael. Um, the perspective of Metropolitan Fire Brigade, I think, is reflective of a whole range of other agencies that identify people who are affected by hoarding and follow. And I suppose in many ways what we're trying to do is when we identify those people, get them to Jane and Mike and Steve. Um, and usually they're uh, notified to us through a range of ways and that can be through an emergency response. 
It can also be through a local council, um, uh, neighbours, family, friends, other emergency services. Any agency that exists basically has made a referral to us. And what our aim is to try and engage that person because what's usually occurred is an event of some kind or an issue that is so um, high in terms of a range of risks that our aim is to try and both engage them to give them some really simple risk reduction advice but gather as much information which means that we can appropriately refer those people on. Um, uh, that's uh, just trying to um, press that, um, moving that forward. Sorry, I'm having a... Um, there any, uh, so, Would you like me to move the slides now? So i just got it, Michael. Um, what, what we do know about hoarding is that um, the idea that hoarding increases risk isn't um, a possibility, it's actually a reality. And people who um, hoard in their homes are actually much more likely to have a fire. We identified that 24% of all fatalities in a 10-year period were actually hoarding-related uh, deaths. And they include a really broad range of um, affected people. It included a surgeon, it included someone who was um, older and a loner and multicultural in background, it included an ex-mayor. They were very, very variant. So we knew straight away that the people affected were very, um, very reflective of what the community looked like. And there was no single feature we could find in any of those fires except that these people lived in, within that um, risk. So we know that these fires are much bigger. We have an obligatory imperative, like most fire services in every state, that if we identify someone affected by it, we really do need to try and engage GPs, we need to engage specialist services, and seek people's cooperation to make those referrals. And as Mike just suggested, we look for leverage. And some of the best practice that's established, like um, in this state and other states as it's developing with public housing, is to actually you know, serve that notice of eviction to get that engagement to move people into um, treatment and receiving uh, support. So, you know, children, I know um, in hoarding properties, we get notified by child protection. We've um, in the last month inspected two properties where seizures are actually taking place and the department seeks us to go out and engage that um, person to provide the advice and then documentation. Um, last week, you know, it was a community residential unit where six adults with disability live, supported by a government program where they were reporting for the roof line. So, you know, the risk in addition to fire is also for this a range of health and safety wellbeing issues that increases people age. Our predominant group are people over 50. And I know some of the research overseas has clearly indicated that that's the stage at which people might first seek help. So I think um, we perceive as a government funded you know, community service provider, our role is to make sure we can support and encourage that link to specialist services and that sometimes you may only have one opportunity to engage in some very effective referrals and that uh, people retreat from that very quickly. Um, the exposure is um, very distressing for some people um, and our advice isn't about um, uh, mass removal. We have certainly looked at the um, specialist information from um, uh, Mike and from Steve and from other specialists in the area, and that's that reduce the risk in the areas where the functional capacity of that home um, is actually occurring, because these are people trying to perform the activities of daily living in what is an extremely hostile environment. So um, it's an unusual position, I suppose, for fire services to adopt, as they are in states around Australia, but that is about identify the areas where the riskiest activities take place, like heating, cooking, and work on those areas and seek that specialist um, support. But um, 
I think New South Wales had five courting related fatalities just last year. So it is certainly increasing in the um, amount of, um, in its frequency, I think because emergency responders and lots of community agencies like local council health and bylaws and all of those different agencies with regulatory and statutory responsibilities are using the same wording. And I think that's why we're seeing it. Um, at the moment, the Metropolitan Fire Brigade in Melbourne responds to reporting related incidents once every eight to 10 days. So this is a fairly frequent occurrence. The risk is very real. And um, we certainly seek to try and um, uh, promote, engage, and leverage people into support programs that are available or um, specialist services. Thank you very much, uh, Julie. Uh, Julie, I, I take it that you're, you're finished your presentation? Yes, sorry. Ha thank you very much. We're just having a few sound problems. Just yeah. a little bit of housekeeping. May I ask the panelists to ensure that the sound is down on their computers and completely mute on their computers? Not participants, but um, the panelists. Uh, we're just having a few sound problems tonight. Um, that was an excellent presentation from, from, from all of the presenters, and I think it certainly helped me recognize the key principles of intervention and the roles of different disciplines in treating, managing, and supporting people who are hoard. Now we're going to go on to the, um, the panel discussion. And in the panel discussion, hopefully, we will better understand the merits, challenges, and opportunities in providing collaborative care to people who are hoard. So I'm just, I have a number of questions here that were given to me earlier. And one question struck me um, initially, and that was from Mike. I believe you had a question for Julie around boundaries in her involvement uh, with Isabella and Brian and about bringing other relevant uh, professionals um, into the management. Could you, could you address that question uh, more fully to Julie, please? Sure. Thanks, uh, thanks Michael. Uh, as we know, Julie, the, you know, leverage is, is a huge issue here and, uh, and engagement. And one of the difficulties, of course, is that the role of the, the fire brigade is a very specific role. And, and I guess you're, uh, what you can or, or can't do is, 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 is limited. And, but I know how successful you've been in being able to engage people in, in the process. So the question then becomes, what are the boundaries around your direct Involvement with Isabella and Brian, and, and how would you go about bringing in other relevant professionals into the management of the challenges that they that they are experiencing? Um, I think um, what we talk to people about is that we have, um, like many fire services around Australia and agencies such as the police and ambulance um, services, that we have a duty of care in relation to a range of risks and for fire services in a lot of states that includes a statutory obligation to um, mitigate risk where it's identified. So part of what we do, and I think because I've worked in case management, we engage people directly and we talk to them about what that risk looks like. That can quite often include a follow-up visit after a fire or emergency response where we take the very precious clutter image rating tool and say, we believe you're at this level. Your risk is um, it is not isolated to you. It's, uh, it's shared by everybody who lives in this property, your neighbours and the MSB and any other responding emergency service. And we have an obligation to make that referral. And our referral is about trying to get support. And I think when they identify that our role isn't to... We have no capacity to force entry unless we believe that risk is absolutely imminent that the place will combust and that there's petrol. So part of that role is about being persuasive and I think promoting that the best treatment in this area is about not a forced removal. Now in Squalor, that's a very different scenario for us and for Squalor, it's a much more um, acute, immediate response and our referrals can often bypass the affected person 
um, on the basis that the level of that risk um, is absolutely elevated and there may appear to be a lack of insight. That's good. Thank you very much for that. Now, um, Stephen, I believe that you had a question for Jane about how um, patients might respond to being referred to a psychiatrist. Yes, Jane, we've, we've mentioned uh, the problem of lack of insight in people who hoard and uh, you know, people are reluctant to accept a referral to a psychiatrist at the best of times. How, how have those patients that you've come across with uh, problems with hoarding responded to the suggestion that they actually see somebody like myself? Well, Stephen, look, the, the experience that I've had with people is that they have been uh, a bit reluctant to uh, acknowledge their problem and to seek help. So one of the things that I've found has been probably the biggest challenge is really to engage with them in a very trusting way um, and to find a little avenue of... Um, of insight or a reason for why they might go and see um, a psychiatrist for an assessment. And, and the thing that I've found most useful to use with people is really to have a discussion with them around um, just being sure that we're getting the best help that's possible for them. And these have been people that have actually seen, can see that what they're doing, if they can't see a problem with it themselves, at least they can acknowledge that other family members or neighbours or um, um, you know people that visit them often can actually um, have commented quite a lot. And, and so they can see that even though it's not something they would really want to change, if other people have got this concern, I've found that it's useful to sort of use that as a way to get them to go and seek help and just say, well, look, let's get an objective um, professional to give their comment and see what they think of that and just to go along for an assessment um, and encouraging them that they're going to get a good reception when they get there and taken seriously and being treated respectfully. Um, but it has taken actually quite a lot of time in the, the few cases, cases that I've been involved with. Thank you very much. We've had a, a number of very good questions um, from, from those uh, who registered and one of which, which I'll throw open to the whole panel uh, and you can, you can run with it as you wish. How can you begin to work with people who hoard but are not ready to address it? Well, um, do, would you want me to start, Michael? Yes, thank you. Mike, yeah. Look, uh, it's really, it's, it's the main question, um, and it is very difficult to engage people who are resistant. Um, I guess in the first instance, you need to work out what is going on and, and what the diagnosis is, because the difficulty in, in, in engaging may be due to um, uh, having a diagnosis other than hoarding disorder. Um, the second issue is, of course, um, developing a relationship and I think um, in particular GPs are in a good in a good position to to do that um, um, they are in a good position position to maintain ongoing contact the, the, the number of physical and medical um, difficulties that this um, population has is, is very significant um, and if there is resistance to mental health assessment or, or referral for, for treatment, then at least a GP can develop a lot of trust in looking after uh, people's health um, and therefore developing that relationship, developing the trust and then I guess focusing on the degree of interference and disability that people are experiencing and using that as leverage to then facilitate a referral on to um, you know someone who, who, who can treat or assess more appropriately. Um, but certainly the notion of interference and disability and focusing on that in order to motivate people to improve their well-being and to, to improve their, um, their, um, their health is, is a very positive motivator. Anybody else got any opinions on that? Um, Jane here. Um, yes, look, I think that one of the, the cases that I... a very memorable case for me um, was actually took... I would you know, being conservative, probably five years um, before that person did agree to seek formal help for the problem. Um, and it was a long process of really getting, gaining their trust, getting to know just how extensive the problem was, um, working with them through a whole lot of uh, litigation issues around um, family um, 
breakup, etc. There were very, very complicated set of circumstances and it was just many, many years and I, I did find it quite amazing to see that person not long ago and they have actually um, decluttered their, their life and um, moved into new accommodation and they are going really well and I think if five years ago someone had said that that would be the case, I would think not, absolutely not. So I suppose it's taught me that um, being patient, taking, you know, being just going at the level that they are happy to go um, and not losing them because I think that's the other thing that can happen if you push a little bit too hard. Um, they just don't come back or um, they, yeah, that you just don't see them again. Thanks, Jen. Steve, do you have any comments on engagement and um, development? I do, and uh, you know, I, I guess I see more people who degenerate passively into squalor than who are hoarders. But uh, you know, to me, it underlines the importance of a good initial assessment to be sure that what you actually are dealing with is hoarding disorder, and that the person who's refusing treatment actually has the capacity to refuse it. Uh, I, I'm actually of the view that a lot of people who end up living in adverse circumstances have a, a, a disability, you know, a cognitive disability that prevents them from making informed decisions about the need for treatment or intervention. And it really requires somebody who's used to making these assessments to, to make the call as to whether this is hoarding disorder and the person has capacity to refuse intervention and treatment or whether there's a duty of care to the person to intervene because of their cognitive disability. Thanks, Steve. Another question that came through from uh, one of the participants online tonight was, uh, and I'll address this initially to you, Julie, is um, how to work collaboratively with councils and NGOs without breaching confidentiality? Look, it is, it is difficult. Um, what we try and work out what each situation looks like and that initial information that you collect um, in relation to a person, their circumstances, um, whether they live alone, whether it's their own house, whether there's infestation, um, whether it's local laws or environmental health, all of those. Clues. And I suppose what, what we do here and because practice has taken so long to be developed, if you didn't collaborate, and I suppose in many ways seek to engage other agencies and take them with you, that it was in both your interests and both agencies' duty of care responsibility to try and achieve um, an improved outcome for that person. But it has been very, um, it's a very taxing process, and I suppose that's what we're helping will come out of um, the best practice recommendation. But, um, Sometimes you seek, we seek to engage people on the fact that they have regulatory responsibilities, either as um, a, you know a local government or a mental health provider, that the situation has become so acute that um, it would be difficult to um, describe in hindsight how they how they had failed or, or were unwilling to be involved. And we try always to make sure that that person that we're making that referral has given consent, but it doesn't mean they don't fall over in that assessment process. And um, that's quite common for us, but I think, um, you know, collaborating is finding out who shares the same responsibility or a larger responsibility than you in terms of um, some people's wellbeing, safety and health issues. And um, that's sometimes a process of elimination. Thanks very much, Judy. Do you, Jane, do you find that you work much with NGOs? Uh, look, I, I think it's something that could happen a lot more. Um, I can think of it only on a, a few occasions, actually, um, and I think it's one of the things that we need to have better ways of engaging general practice with the social sector. It's a, a actual research interest of mine because it's just something that doesn't happen routinely and easily. And for the times that you do it, um, you really have to put a huge amount of time in place to get those links to occur. Um, and I think that it, we really should be able to do it more smoothly. Um, when it has occurred, 
when we have had good engagement for various um, reasons. I mean, one particular case I'm thinking of is someone who was actually living much more in, in squalor and we had a um, really great engagement with people from the Brotherhood of St. Lawrence and uh, a couple of the other um, uh, agencies to work that out and it was excellent and it really made it so much easier than not having them in got involved. But um, it's not routine, unfortunately. Uh, just a question that I might put to you just on that. Many of our uh, participants tonight live in regional and rural Australia. I can see uh, Pamela from Darwin has logged on. Uh, many in much smaller communities may not have the assets that you have in Melbourne. Could you give us some advice as to how we might find appropriate um, uh, people to refer uh, people with hoarding disorder to in regional and rural Australia? Um, well, look, I, I think I would have to say that probably most GPs around the country would find this not an easy thing to identify off the top of their head, unfortunately. Um, I find myself going to things like um, the Australian Psychological Association, find a psychologist uh, website and looking in for various um, interest areas that psychologists might have and trying to work out um, whether they are nearby where the patient lives and, and how we might get them together. Um, with psychiatrists, it's really difficult. Um, and that, I think, you know, from my point of view, I suppose I um, get get to know, due to my research interests, a few more of the psychiatrists with special interests in particular areas. But it's not as easy with psychiatry to identify um, where the psychiatrists are and exactly what their interests are. Um, and I think that there's lots of excellent programs that you'll find underway in various um, private clinics, um, in public, you know, public mental health services, community mental health services, but actually accessing that and finding um, the program, it's it's actually quite a, a challenge and one that you would think in our age of technology there would be a simple sort of search finder. Um, and I know now that Medicare locals that have been recently established. A lot of them are really trying to um, bring about better connections between the health professionals. Um, but it is a difficult thing. I mean, I'd love to have a, just be able to Google the website, you know, psychiatrist and hoarding and, and find the nearest postcode <laughs> so that we could do it. But it's not as simple as that. Um, and I do think that for the average practitioner, um, that it just, it does take time and it's time out of a really busy day. And from the GPs I know, they're often doing it, you know, in their break, they're doing it after hours, they're phoning up, they're searching to try and match to find the right, the right person for that problem. So it's, it's a, it is a challenge, but I think it's, it's worth usually in each practice. I find there's some, one, somebody, one of the practitioners will know somewhere. So having good networks amongst your, the, the GPs and, um, that you know and being able to email each other and ask for suggestions is what I would, you know, using those personal networks. There's no simple answer, Michael, unfortunately. Michael, can I just uh, butt in here as well? Because um, there are a range of emerging resources now. Sydney has a 1-800 number. Um, or was it a one three hundred number? I'm not sure. Um, but it's, it's run by Catholic Community Care. Brisbane is developing a, a similar kind of response group. Um, you know, Western Australia and South Australia also expressing interest in, in that work. Um, the Australian Psychological Society is supporting a series of training workshops across the country. So Richard Moulding and myself are going around the country doing these workshops on the assessment, diagnosis and uh, case formulation and treatment of hoarding. Um, our own group is actually putting on an online treatment uh, with therapists and video conferencing supports. Unfortunately, that won't be ready for another 6 to 12 months, but it certainly will be online very soon. And there are a range of bibliotherapy supports as well. So the Buried in Treasures book I find to be a particularly useful book by, um, I think it's Tolan, uh, Steckety and Frost, or Frost and Steckety. Um, uh, there, there are a range of work books by Frost and Steckety as well. Um, and I think that they're very useful for therapists to, to acquire and to, um, and to use some of the materials in there. So it, it's, it, it's not all bleak, um, but Certainly there is a need for more resources. My personal view is that there's a need for a kind of a centralised number, if you like, because it is very difficult for families and for uh, affected individuals to work their way through 
a very complex system. I mean, Brian is lucky in that he found a, a GP who was willing to listen, but most family members, um, I mean, the, the amount of family conflict um, and family distress in the families of people with hoarding problems is as great as uh, is the case in schizophrenia. So it is a very serious problem for families as much as for the affected individual. And I think we forget that group as well. And of course, just having a you know someone to talk to and to talk through some of their own frustrations is a very useful process. I think Michael, just I would mention there is the national um, psychiatrist dial a psychiatrist number that GPs yes. can ring, and um, you know the GP helpline for a psychiatrist. That's to really speak to a psychiatrist over the telephone to get a, re a reply, and you do get one um, within a, a fairly um, you know short amount of time, but it won't necessarily give you access to to referral or um, to the right sort of person, but that's something people can try from anywhere. Yes, I guess in a, in a rural area it's more important, isn't it, because you're unlikely to be able to access a face-to-face -face assessment, but if you as the GP can access some advice on the sort of things you should be looking for, mm. then that's a big help in, uh, in facilitating your own assessment. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. I, I think too, Michael, the idea that um, it would stop at any boundary of a metropolitan region is a big issue that we've had um, in Victoria and I know in New South Wales as well. But it was interesting during the uh, floods of a year ago, 18 months ago, that um, areas where um, the country fire authority said that there wasn't uh, very much hoarding and it didn't seem to be in a rural remote area, suddenly identified you know, a quite significant number of properties that had been hoarded in that were flooded. So it wasn't as a result of fire the relief provided for um, flooding. So, you know, the issue of um, what services exist um, in the rural area or remote area are compounded by um, access, but it really hasn't been that much better in a metropolitan area. It requires some pretty imaginative thinking to um, work out who you're going to engage and um, what kind of fuel assessment you're going to try and broker. Um, agencies to do. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for that. One other question that, that, that has kept on coming through tonight is how can we work with partners and family who have to live amongst all the hoarded uh, materials and, and, and with hoarders? Would you like to comment on that? And partner support, family support, collaboratively? Well, um, it's Mike here again. Look, um, I, I did mention a couple of things before about um, about providing um, information to partners, um, not only in terms of understanding the disorder and, and, and the thinking and, and, and the other vulnerability factors um, leading to the hoarding, um, but also to, to give them some information about the recovery process. Um, it's a very long recovery process. This is not a problem that goes away with a few weeks of medication or, you know, 12 sessions of psychotherapy. Um, uh, clutter takes a long time to sift through. Um, and one of the things that we can do for partners is help them to deal with their frustrations um, and, and thus minimise the conflict that's going on in the family, um, give, them, um, give them somewhere where they can actually vent their own feelings and their own frustrations. Um, and actually give them some skills in dealing with their own anxiety, their own depression, um, because these are also very common um, in, in, in partners as well. I think just adding to that, Mike, that um, one of the, the things that can happen um, that I've seen is this escalation of of, um, of things within the family where there's a lot of arguing and um, conflict and just trying to diffuse that. So we, even just being able to uh, help help them see the partner that maybe isn't the hoarder to see or the child to, to sort of take time out to try and diffuse the situation instead of escalate it and hopefully see that if that, that happens that the uh, actual person with the problem will perhaps become a little easier to deal with and that they, they tend to go and uh, make it even worse when they're under a lot of stress and pressure. Would you agree with that? Absolutely, absolutely. And there actually are some good um, resources for um, 
for that. Um, there's a book by, well, the name will come to me soon, um, that we use um, for family and friends. It's, um, it's called Digging Out. Um, and I'm just trying to remember who wrote it. Um, it will come to me soon. Just give me a sec while I go through my own memory banks. <laughs> You'd think I'd know it off the top of my head. <laughs> I'm on the spot now and hundreds of people are watching, so... <laughs> That's fine. It, We're enjoying it. it. It's gone. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, here it is. I've got it here in front of me. Um, okay, so there's uh, Tompkins and Hartle, H-A-R-T-L. So Michael Tompkins and uh, Tamara Hartle, and it's called Digging Out, Helping Your Loved One Manage Clutter. Etc. Etc. And and MHBN can can arrange to 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 append that to to the um, records of of this webinar. That's that's great. Thanks very much. One question that did come through was: Is there any difference in the demographics of orders, particularly in relation to age? Um, I would imagine that orders would be more in the older age group, or am I wrong? Look, uh, if I could answer that, Michael. I mean, people who have Hoarding disorder, it characteristically has its onset in the teenage years or early 20s, but it only reaches the stage of critical mass where the circumstances are so cluttered that uh, the living spaces are unusable. It, it takes a while to accumulate vast amounts of rubbish. Uh, it tends to present in old age despite having been present for many years before. I think when somebody starts hoarding uh, solely in old age, then that's more likely to be indicative of another underla underlying organic uh, condition other than hoarding disorder as such. So, Mike, um, early intervention? Um, look, it's an interesting question. We, we have no data. Um, it, it's, it's an interesting uh, issue here. We tend to focus on, on people who, who are living in clutter or squalor, but um, we tend to forget for instance, children who are being brought up in, in that kind of environment, so that's one issue. Um, there are genetic links, so that's another issue. Um, there's modelling and, and um, you know, the, the, the kind of learning that one does in that kind of an environment, um, that's another issue. And of course, for those who do have early onset, um, what do you do? Um, most of the people that I see in that younger age group actually have OCD or, or some form of OCD and are reticent to throw things out because they need to know or because they're afraid of contaminating other people. So I, I think more work needs to be done in this area. Um, we just do not have enough information. Julie, what's your experience on the demographics of, um, of people that you meet? Um, in terms of the incidents that we've reported, um, in terms of an emergency response, um, in the metropolitan district, we identify fires and incidents in over um, 55 different suburbs and there doesn't appear to be any demographic link at all. It can be somewhere in Turak, it could be somewhere in, um, you know, on the outskirts of the Melbourne um, fringe area. We also commonly see um, multi-generational um, family in one um, home. So that can be some of the ones, the variables, um, Three generations, one, the eldest being retired, of um, Melbourne Circus. Yep. Um, living in a very, very expensive home with the most extraordinary level of water. To someone who lives alone in office of housing property, the one um, common thing is that they're hoarding. There seems to be no other single um, issue that seems to bind them together or make them similar. Um, probably the most recurring characteristic in talking to um, affected people is that um, most of them would probably um, appear to be incredibly sharp, um, very um, ha happy to engage to a degree, but very um, quick. Um, I think the presentation is um, they're probably distressed that we're there, or um, but People who are quite um, articulate, people who are very familiar with what their own behaviours are. And do you have any comments on, on the demographics? 
Uh, no, I don't know. I, I would agree with what Julie said. Yep. yep. Steve, um, would you like to add anything else to early intervention? You, you feel that it's Early intervention is difficult because people with hoarding disorder as such tend not to present themselves for treatment until fairly late on. I, I suppose going forward the best avenue for early intervention might be for the carer or spouse or child of somebody who has hoarding disorder to encourage them to present early rather than waiting until things reach crisis point with uh, a breakdown in hygiene or, God forbid, a house fire uh, forcing a crisis. So it, it requires a, an increased degree of awareness on behalf of the community, I think, to facilitate any form of early intervention in a disorder that uh, tends to be uh, you know, very much on the slow burn. That's very good. Thank you very much. And I'm just going to put the last question to you before we go into the, the last uh, part of the webinar where we sum up. Um, and that's a, an excellent question that came through from one of our participants. I want to know about the line between overkeeping and hoarding, and when does it become a disorder? Is it part of an already existing OCD? Does anybody like to start on that? I, I guess uh, DSM-5 is blurring the boundaries a bit. Uh, you know, previously there were uh, hoarding subtypes of OCD described in DSM-4, but no separate hoarding disorder. Now they've created a hoarding disorder which seems to have all of the manifestations of OCD, yet which is uh, called something different. Uh, I, I guess one of the controversies about earlier editions of the DSM were that there was a, a clinically significant impairment or distress criteria added to many of the diagnostic categories. And uh, you know, one of the definers of hoarding disorder as opposed to uh, overkeeping or collecting, if you like, is that the condition causes significant distress or impairment and the degree of clutter has reached a point where living areas have actually become unusable. Uh, Michael, it, it, I absolutely agree with, with what Steve just said, but often people with a hoarding problem will say to you, I'm not a hoarder, I'm a collector. And it's, it's just such a wonderful justification for, for, for what's going on in their home. But there are real differences between collectors and, and, and people who have a hoarding problem. Um, collectors usually um, have possessions that are restricted to a particular part of the house. The possessions are in good nick. Um, they're well organised um, and they have little problem in discarding doubles or, or, or broken, uh, broken possessions. Um, whereas people who have a hoarding problem tend to be consumed, all consumed by the possessions. They give them a, a tenuous sense of security. They're disorganized. They compromise their accommodation. They lead to this disability and distress that, that Steve talked about. So you can really see the differences between the extremes. But of course, there's going to be a group in the middle where, you know, there's a bit of a value judgment that goes on there. Um, and at the end of the day, like most mental health problems, um, we are making value judgments about the degree of disability and distress and the compromise in people's well-being that, that you know, that the possessions or, or any other kind of symptom cause. Jane, any comments on that? Uh, yes, look, I was just having some thoughts about whether, you know, the average teenager whose uh, room has turned into a complete squalor, how you identify the ones who are going to end up um, becoming hoarders. Um, I had that thought, having some young young men at home. Um, I also, uh, so I think that there is that element of, of um, grey zone, but I think that the... The people, when people share accommodation with the person, I think then it becomes a little easier because um, other people can tell that this is not quite right. Whereas they might tolerate, you know, the the person that is um, the 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 collector that's getting a little bit extreme when it turns into a real problem. I think it's because of other things in the person's behaviour that even the family might not quite be able to put the finger on, but they can they know that it's happening and they seek help. I think when people live alone um, and this occurs that it can be, uh, you know, my, my experience is that that takes a lot longer. And I'll, uh, one clinical example I had was a, a person that was at our clinic many years ago and then for some um, reason, because the local council in fact 
the next door neighbour um, had in an, a, um, a request to the council because they had a, ma a mouse plague and when the um, people went around to investigate it turned out that it was someone who'd been coming to our clinic for years and years and years and they had an absolutely um, boarding on hoarding and squalor situation. And at the clinic, we had had no idea that this was the case and we'd seen this person for many, many years and they lived alone and they went to work and nobody knew until this occurred. So I think living alone is really problematic and hard to tell. I don't know if... Um, Stephen or Mike or Julie have any comments about that? But I, I had the exact same situation with uh, sorry, one of my Steve. patients. Sorry, uh, Michael. I'm, I'm very, very sorry. This happens with every webinar. We're running out of time. <laughs> I'm so sorry. You each have two minutes in which to sum up, and I will be very punitive on the two minutes because we have nine minutes left. And I'm going to ask Julie to go first. Okay, um, what um, we'd like to recommend is that um, people uh, follow the line of trying to engage people in their home to quantify what that issue looks like, to identify that level of risk and to work as collaboratively as possible. I don't think a single strong approach ever works. Um, you need to engage other agencies, whether they're you know, aged care or aged psych assessment teams, the Commonwealth funded programs that exist in every in every state, the mental health programs, and then look for those leverage agencies at the same time. What what we do know is that from a risk perspective, this is um, absolutely increasing as the weeks go by. It's quite phenomenal to see the difference between identifying 50 fires in 10 years and then identifying nearly 100 in and that's because we're all using the same language. But the risk um, these people experience is, is very high and engagement is a really slow process. So those opportunities can only come up when, as Jane and, and Mike and Steve have said, there's some incident that occurs or some kind of um, engagement by somebody else who um, initiates contact with a third party. So you need to try and utilise those opportunities find out regionally who you can work with. Thanks very much, Julie, and thank you for your contribution. Mike, may I give you two minutes? Okay, well, I guess differential diagnosis is something that we've all talked about, and it's obviously very important. Um, we need to understand and to have a good case formulation, understanding the, the full context of people's lives, and don't judge. Um, you know, uh, don't force uh, solutions. Uh, tread carefully. Um, but of course, if someone's living in squalor and they're elderly and, and, and need to be looked after, then obviously you, you, you do exactly that. Um, and use all resources, both professional, uh, multidisciplinary and, and community resources. There are a whole range of resources out there, um, from the fire brigade all the way through to the GP. And I think all avenues of help are, are useful and have something to, to contribute. Thanks, Thanks very much, Mike. Steve, you can have your two minutes, thanks. I'd like to, again, bang the uh, assessment drum, Michael. Uh, you can't manage a problem without knowing what it is you're managing, and I think it's vital to differentiate hoarding disorder from other conditions which can manifest as a squalid environment, and the best way to make that call is to get a proper assessment, ideally by a, a psychiatric team. Often geriatric psychiatrists or neuropsychiatrists are better at doing a broader range of cognitive assessments than their general psychiatry colleagues. Uh, CAT teams, of course, are often the only psychiatric professionals that you can actually get to go and attend a squalid premise, premises, but they tend to be uniformly badly at, bad at doing cognitive assessments. What you really uh, need to look for is uh, a frontal lobe or an executive type impairment and flagging the sort of deficits to the uh, uh, re referring target that you're looking for, uh, at least then cues them in on what they should be doing. Thanks very much, Stephen. Jane. Um, yes, look, I just hope that uh, everybody communicates amongst each other and particularly for those listeners that um, work with GPs to encourage them to keep GPs informed of what's 
happening and have them uh, active in the treatment team. And I think from the GP perspective that perhaps one of the roles we can play is for being there, looking at the whole person, looking at the rest of their physical health and addressing their lifestyle factors, trying to get them engaged in life, trying to get them out and active and having a healthy lifestyle both um, with a, a, some exercise and good nutrition. And, and I think those things often aren't happening in these situations. And so we can be doing things to assist in that, that regard that might help the person as well to um, get back on track along with the more sophisticated psychological interventions. So being there and respectful and trust, having a trusting relationship is really important. Thanks very much, Jane. Um, I'd just like to sum up just a few of the key messages for me. This was a, a great learning experience as all of these webinars are. I feel very privileged to be a facilitator and I, I trust the participants um, uh, enjoyed and, and learnt um, the collaborative points that we've all made. Um, assessment to me seems extremely important, uh, particularly I, I'll take Stephen's point about the cognitive assessment. And often um, a busy GP, even even if it has some training, it's it's virtually impossible to do a proper cognitive assessment on somebody. So collaboration with other professionals is essential, uh, particularly with psychiatrists and psychologists. Uh, a proper diagnosis is always a good place to start in managing somebody. So um, I think the more uh, professionals who, who can get involved, and also um, you know, skilled community professionals such as Julie, um, who are actually working in the ground, who can assess risk um, in this situation often better than, um, than mental health uh, professionals can, uh, is extremely use useful. I also took the point about that we shouldn't judge people um, and that we should be careful and that we should move sometimes slowly and sometimes quickly and to always remember uh, to think of the patient uh, as a human being often who is suffering um, in their squalor or in their hoarding um, and to look on them as, as James so wisely said as, as a whole person. These webinars always seem to go for too short a time um, I would love to sit here speaking with you all for another hour, but we are just at the end uh, of this webinar on hoarding. I would like to thank you, Stephen, Jane, Julie, and Mike, for an excellent presentation, very good points. I'll, I'll certainly be downloading um, this webinar onto, onto um, Memory Stick and keeping it with me for that day when I need it. Um, and I am sure all the participants feel the same way. So once again, on behalf of MHBN, may I thank our panel and may I thank our participants for logging on tonight. Good night.